Okay, folks. So real quick before we get underway, we have a couple of special guests. I think this one. Leave your towel. <laughs> uh, we have a couple special guests we want to introduce you to. So as you know, Jamie's been the CEO here at the club for the past 20 plus years. And obviously there's been a lot of change in that time. Um, even if you just look at the development of the players that have come through here and kind of the reputation that Virginia has, it's, it's really special and, un and unique and um, pretty unbelievable. But uh, we would be remiss if we didn't say that uh, it obviously requires a lot from the membership in order to trust the, the path that we're on. Um, the things that Jamie and uh, the staff and other board members see are important to helping us to get better and keep elevating the club. And we have two visionaries from our board of directors here this afternoon, Mr. Lou Rampino and Mr. Justin White. Um, I've sat in a lot of board meetings with Mr. Rampino in particular, and there's no doubt much how we feel about golf and trying to improve ourselves and get better. He embodies that and, and feels that about Virginia Country Club and is a big part of how we are here today. And uh, Mr. White is a current board member, is our Pro Shop Committee Chairman, and always looking to move, in, move the needle. And uh, again, just the ability to do something like this. Um, obviously, we, we need their support and uh, their stamp of approval. So thank you, gents, for letting us uh, be here and have this special event today. Our next presenter is one of Australia's leading performance psychologists, combines sports psychology with neuroscience. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about how we do that. And over the past 20 years, he's basically been on a mission to help people fulfill their potential on the biggest stage. And that stage may be something different than golf. He works across a span of disciplines, including Olympic athletes, Aussie rules football clubs, elite tennis players, car racing teams, endurance athletes, surgeons, CEOs, and a variety of multinational corporations. He's the CEO of North, his own business and executive coaching company. And for the past several years, has been a huge part of Cameron Smith, fast descent in the golf world. Smith is a six-time PGA Tour winner and the 2022 Open Champion. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Mr. Jonah Oliver. Thanks for having me. Just a quick sound. Can people hear okay up the back? Yeah, great. Uh, I did spend years as a university lecturer, so the people who are the furthest back will get the hardest questions. So feel free to move. But it, in all seriousness, Position yourself where you can see, right? If you're squinting into the sun, pick your chair up and move. Um, use a bit of common sense, but yeah, don't like we're going to be here for 45, 50 minutes. Then we're going to probably move across to the putting green, uh, share a bit about um, some of the things I do in, in putting and some of the things I do with Cam in that space. So we'll, we'll, we'll hop up and move. I'm getting a fair bit of wind, eh? Do you want, shall I try that? Let's try that hand mic thing because that's just that's pretty noisy. Do you want to switch me off from behind? Is that, whoa, is that better? Yeah, okay. You might just want to drop the volume levels or something. The, is that better? All right. I really enjoyed that last presentation, by the way. I always love coming to different conferences and, and scenarios and meeting new people and, and hearing like-minded people present. I actually want to dovetail into the back of some things that were, were said in that presentation and it just, it really set me alight with... Uh, a classic uh, analogy I guess I use when I'm doing coach education and that's the difference between an abacus and Google Maps. If you teach kids how to use an abacus, it only has, I don't know, eight beads, you know, four rows or what have you, but it turns out that they can then do multiplications into the tens of thousands because they understand the principles of multiplication. It's an incredible instrument, the abacus. You teach a six-year-old basics of counting and doing some simple math and they will have a lifelong gift of being able to do massive calculations in their brain if they can just picture the abacus and then they'll solve the puzzle. If I asked you guys to get to LAX from here right now and not use Google Maps, I guarantee some of you would get lost driving out of the streets. We are worse at driving now than we have ever been in history of time. 15, 20 years ago, you'd pay attention when you drove somewhere because you knew you had to remember your way of getting home. You had a better understanding of north, east, south. 
we orientated. Google Maps has made us worse at a skill that it's so good at solving. I spend my life on driving ranges, in Formula One teams, in football clubs, and we're addicted to technology. I'm a tech nerd, I love technology, but you have gotta use it in the right way. I see too many golfers, too many golf coaches. Whack, look, data, what happened coach? What does it say, what does the number mean? They are literally stripping their brain of the ability of owning their golf swing. And I don't want to you know, be too harsh, but I will be passionate about it. Think about your use of technology. Think about your role as a coach. Are you an abacus or are you a Google Maps? Mum and dad are paying the check and they want to hear lots of you talking. Some of the best coaches don't say anything. I fly to the other side of the world, Cam Smith's coach and I will fly off and together and people say, what did you say to him before that? Yeah, not a lot. Because we knew that wasn't relevant, we didn't need to. Still sent my invoice. It's about knowing when not to say something, not just saying something to justify your existence. So I just wanted to follow up on, on some comments that were made in that talk that I loved about how to use technology. Please, it is... A, we, we live in this incredible you know, 21st century, but I see humans getting weaker at some really basic fundamentals because of technology. So think about your coaching philosophy, think about the labs you set up, think about the lovely plasmas and all the 3D modeling and the motion capture and all the, th yeah, I've seen it all, all my clients use it as well. But one of the biggest things I do is I go into those environments and I interrogate heavily how we're using it, what we're using it for, and making sure we're not actually stripping the athlete from owning their own swing mechanics. So that's probably just one that I wanted to start with. Um, <clears throat> so what do I do for a living? I help people focus on the right thing at the right time. I can't make people more talented. I can't make them smarter. I just simply help them get out of their own way. So I help them focus on the right thing at the right time. What's the most common thing that gets in their way of maintaining task-focused attention? Generally their own intrinsic noise. And I want to debunk a whole bunch of myths today and try to just give you one or two, three things. Actually, I want to give you a margarita pizza. If you guys can walk out of here with a margarita pizza, three things, the three essential ingredients, then Maybe there's, you know, you can, and take that into your coaching, that'll be a success for me. And let's begin by debunking a bit of the stuff that's out there in the world of psychology, pop psychology, uh, books you may have read. The first one is, it's not about reducing stress and pressure. It's about building capacity to embrace more. I don't want to gloss over that. It's not about reducing stress and pressure. You want to be an athlete who performs in the spotlight, you've got to learn to have the ability to you know, tolerate huge amounts of discomfort. So I'll come back to talking about the things we do that are well-intentioned that actually make our athletes weaker. It's not about positive thinking. It's about taking positive action no matter what you're feeling and thinking. Yeah, what do we spend our time trying to do? Help our clients be more positive in their mind, but their thoughts. No, it's about taking positive action when you're not feeling very confident or positive. And lastly, it's not how hard something is, it's how important something is. If we lose connection with how important something is, then we just focus on the pain. I was too stressed, the anxiety was too much, I was so angry, I felt really A, motivated in the morning, and you know, just hit the snooze button, whatever, right? We'll always focus on the pain if we don't connect to the importance. So shoot back through those three again. It's not about reducing stress and pressure. If you were doing well-intentioned to try to help your athletes be less anxious, less stressed, less worried, less negative, less angry, you're actually making them weaker. To be an elite athlete, you have to feel huge amounts 
And the first metaphor and analogy I'll use, and I apologize for people at the back, but you can get closer, is the old glass of water. Glass of water. We got a tournament this weekend, so I'm, you know, there's a little bit of stress in my cup. And I didn't sleep well because my whoopy zoopy doopy band said I didn't sleep well, so that made me a bit stressed because it wasn't green. <laughs> And then um, my dog's sick. I really love that dog. So now I've got some other stuff outside of golf to add to my cup of water. And then this, the last lesson I have with my coach before I you know, drive to that tournament, and I just, I literally was just, I wasn't hitting it well. I just couldn't make really clean contact. And so now I'm really you know, worried about that last lesson and how the ball wasn't coming off the club face how I wanted. Then I get to the, to the tournament and my girlfriend breaks up with me. And oh no, I'm about, it's, you know, my brain is, I'm about to overflow. I'm about to have a meltdown. Quick, I better call my coach, call my psychologist, call my somebody, right? I'm about to, and we all go, oh, we better do something to reduce the amount of stress this person has. We need to somehow make them feel better. We need to take away some of that. Maybe, I don't know, should we... Maybe they shouldn't go in the tournament. Maybe we should, maybe we should you know, withdraw, hey? Could just, cause, you know, we don't want them to, to lose their confidence. Wouldn't want that. Um, and then we should probably go on a holiday or something, you know? Let them relax and just take the... Pre How about we just become a bigger vessel? How about we become a bigger vessel? You want to navigate life? Life's tough. Life's hard. People fail. You can take all that stress and you put it into that vessel, all of a sudden there's a lot more room for other things to, to occur. Cam Smith was so nervous on the final few holes of the open he couldn't swallow water. I can talk about that because you know, it's not a secret that I, his caddy gives him a water. We always do a bit of a reset, which I can talk about, and how to you know, just bring yourself back into the present, a bit of a sip of water, a lot going on. He wasn't naive to the context. And his throat wouldn't even swallow. He like, nearly choked on international telly and they had a you know, laugh about it now. Oh, Joan, he was so calm. He was in the zone. He was in a state of flow. He's just so unwavering his confidence. No, he was scared. He was nervous. He knew the context. He could hear the crowd. We knew where Rory was at. We, we were, you know, he's human. But he and I had done work around him being okay at feeling that discomfort. He's really good at being uncomfortable. His heart rate was high, adrenaline was high, throat wouldn't swallow water, but he was able to engage in his shots and hit normal swing mechanics, which we'll talk about later on in this talk. So, really want to emphasize that. What you see on television, what looks like confidence is competence. Quick English lesson. What's the difference between confidence and competence? Thank you. Yeah, one is feeling like you can do something and one is you can do something. So it's Latin for those scholars out there, confide. So every day though, I switch on, you know, I won't be too patronizing, but I switch on some of this American sport. Oh man, he was so confident out there today. And I'm like, wow, you can read his brain? Amazing. What they're saying is he was competent or she was competent. But we all use the wrong word and language matters. The first thing you can do as coaches is stop using the word confidence when you're meaning competence. What does confidence look like over time? Here is, comp sorry, here is competence over time. Competence. It's a wiggly line because you're all scholars and teachers and you understand that, you know, biomechanics and things and people grow like we heard earlier. But generally over time, we're better than we were when we were six. What does confidence look like over time? It's a very technical drawing. I know you can't see at the back, but you'll get the gist of it. I have, I have Cam Smith as nervous as he was when he was a 12-year-old playing at one team of golf club. Actually, probably more. But, you know, what? three days before he was... Oh, sorry, the other way around. You know, he was really feeling good. 
but we don't emphasize it because we don't really care. If he wakes up and he feels confident, okay, nice, sure. But if he wakes up and he's not, it's not like, ooh, okay, oh, I've got to do something to... It's like, yeah, I'm pretty nervous, Jonah. Yeah, no worries, mate. It's the final day of the Open. Yeah, okay, yeah, fair point. All right. What do you want to do today? Uh, play my normal golf? Okay, sounds like a plan. All right. Let's do that then. Okay. But there's meaning behind that. We don't club down. We don't decelerate into the grain. We don't leave putts short. We don't change the targets. There's a lot of depth to saying, I'll go out there and play my normal golf. It's easy to say. It's hard to do when you're in the 17th and you've got to hit that putt. But we don't change our putt. We don't change acceleration of the club through the ball or whatever. So you've got to really think a bit about building the competency of our athletes and allowing the variance of confidence to just dance around like a human does. Whereas as younger athletes particularly, and our children particularly, make a massive error in judgment. Kids will see us as adults navigate life and go, he doesn't worry as much as I do. He doesn't feel fraudulent like I do. She doesn't feel like she's an odd one out like I do. Because generally as adults, we're a bit better at, you know, maybe having a tough day at work, but we can still get on with what we're doing. But kids misinterpret it and think that we don't feel those emotions in the first place. They then do the same with elite athletes. They switch on the telly, they see Cam, Tiger, Rory, whoever, and they go, those guys don't worry. They don't get nervous. They're always confident. They have un un unwavering self-belief. They don't have fear of failure. There must be something wrong with me. And then they walk into an interview, and the first thing the interviewer says, you're really confident out there today, champ. He goes, yeah, I was really confident. And you're like, what? You both just lied to each other. I was in the hotel room when you were there running to the bathroom five times and not wanting to eat your breakfast. You know? So a gift you can give kids is to normalise the emotions you feel as a human. And if you've got elite athletes, get them to normalise their experience, what it's like to play tournament golf and the emotions that show up. But also that they can still play great golf with that there. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna abandon the white book, it's just too hard for people at the back. When we're young and we wake up one day and it's, it's at an athletics carnival, it's cross country or something that you're really good at and you've got some positive thoughts, can't wait, love it, I'm good at it, I'm competent. Your feelings are normally quite good, yeah? Positive, confident feelings. You then go out and you run well and you come home with your ribbon or your medal and mum says, how'd you go champ? And you say, great. Oh, why did you do so well? Oh, it's just so confident. I loved it. Oh, that's awesome. And then later that week, you've got English recital where you've got to stand up and do some Shakespeare or read something out and you haven't read because you're an athlete and you're being lazy. And all of a sudden, you've got some negative thoughts. Uh-oh, I'm going to get embarrassed. I'm going to get that red rash up my neck. I'm going to stutter. The girls are going to laugh at me. So now I've got some anxious thoughts and feelings. And I do. I stuff up. I go home, mum says, how'd English presentation go? He's, no good, why not? I got too anxious. Oh no, darling, too anxious. Okay, we've got to work on those nerves. And you do this hundreds of thousands of times in everyday life. You go to say a funny joke and you forget the line and you stuff up and you get, and then the boys laugh and you, oh, I stuffed up because I got anxious. You, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So by the time we then become a teenager or into adult form, and here we are as an elite athlete, think about the relationship you have just reinforced hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times that when I have negative thinking and when I have anxiety, it leads to underperformance. There's one fatal error in that whole equation that you've not understood. And that is when I believe my anxiety or my negative thinking is bad, I then try to do something about it. I try to get rid of those thoughts, block them out, stop thinking of the red balloon. I try to 
replace it. I'm so okay. I'm good. I got this today. Yeah, but maybe not. Uh, no, no. I know how to play, but maybe not. Uh, you know, we try to get into thought replacement, thought suppression, thought distraction. Here's the kicker. We fail. Now, this is going to be a bit Dr. Phil here, so tune in. I've got this deep belief that I can't be negative and worried because it leads to underperformance. And I've got hundreds of thousands of trials to show you, Jonah, that I've got evidence to, to confirm that. I then try to get rid of these negative thoughts and feelings when they've shown up and I'm failing. I am now failing at getting rid of something that I deeply believe I have to get rid of or my golf game's going to suffer. What now has happened to my anxiety? That's what's called for the psychologists in the room a metacognitive panic attack. The reason athletes choke, the reason athletes lose their brain, the reason athletes underperform well beyond you, you know, you, how did he, why is he playing like that? Is their focus. Underperformance in sport is a breakdown of focus. It is not excessive anxiety, doubt, worry, negativity, low confidence, negative self talk. It's, it's focus. If you believe those things are bad, you will then try to get rid of them, you will fail, and it just reels you in like a big fish, and you are focusing intrinsically on your brain, you're walking around looking at your heart rate data, you're trying to deep breathe, you're trying to use positive keywords, you're trying to do all these things, and, and you know what you're not thinking about? A mid-flight at seven iron, a little bit left to right at the pin, and like, you're not, there's no way you're engaged in that shot. It'll look like you are, you'll still go through your pre-shot routine, and you wonder why you're not really hitting that with, you know, connection. It's because you're not there. You've got what's called cognitive dissonance. Your eyes and your mind aren't aligned. So that's one huge point I'd love everyone to understand. Anytime athletes underperform in any sporting context, it's a breakdown in focus, not the presence of tough emotions. I don't really have a whiteboard marker, do I? I'll talk you through this, so those who can't see it. This is a three-step model. It has a lot of complexity behind it. But I love things that are simple. It's a model of what's called psychological flexibility. For those who love reading and studying and you want to look at you know, contextual psychology and what works with humans, psychological flexibility is the framework that has been around 30 years. Last 20 years, it's really got traction. Last 10 years, it's taken off. Um, I was a bit of a lone wolf in Australia for the last 18 years saying, this is the way to go. Um, and now, thankfully, you know, everyone's on board with it because the science shows that it's unbelievably good in sport. Psychological flexibility. What is that? The ability to pursue life goals in the presence of tough human experience. Still being able to get up and go for your run when you're amotivated. Still being able to hit that putt when you're really scared. Still being able to talk in that board meeting when you're feeling like maybe I'm the only one here with this opinion and I've got the anxiety. Psychological flexibility is I will still behave the right way in the presence of tough internal experiences. Three elements to it. There's more, but three that I give athletes. Step one, open up or embrace. You have to learn to embrace tough emotions. That's really founded on what we call acceptance. Acceptance is it's okay to be nervous. Diffusion is thanks brain, just my thoughts. Just my thoughts. You know, I get my athletes to give them even a silly name. Dogs are barking, birds are chirping. Got one of my racing car drivers because of these cheese, you know. I call mine my chatter. Oh, thanks, brain. Just my chatter. Yeah, just thoughts. So learning to sit more with discomfort and accept that that's the price of entry. You want to you want to play in that final pairing on the final day at the Masters, but you don't want to be nervous. Come on, it's the price of entry. So learn to embrace. You have to be able to embrace the emotion before you can even move to the next two steps. The next two steps are actually pretty easy. Be present. So there's heaps out there in mindfulness and well, that's, that's great stuff. Do it. Learn how to train up the prefrontal frontal cortex so you can be better at connecting to the here and now. But a lot of, a lot of athletes are like, oh, I took a breath, Jonah, and then I just went in and said, you know, I just hit it. And it's like, uh-huh, how'd you go? Yeah, not playing that well. They weren't embracing. <laughs> they hadn't done step one of, 
Whew. Wow. Brain's pretty spicy. I'm on the cut line. Well, how are you meant to think and feel if you're on the cut line? Like, let's get a bit better at just normalising that. Ah, oh, you're right. I'm just nervous. Normal nerves. Yeah. Actually, about time it showed up. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean it goes away. It means you're okay at, at being there. Now I can drop anchor and have a sip of water or do a breath or whatever. But here's the kicker. Think about this. I'm on the course. Nerves are rising. I've done the right stuff. Okay, yeah, no, Jonah said to embrace the nerves. It's okay. It's all good. Oh, that's right. He said do the breath work to get into the present. Ooh, oh, yeah. Ooh, oh, that feels a bit better. Yeah. What am I doing in that moment? I'm actually calming, trying to calm myself down. So it's a classic little error people make is they use these breath work, the apps, the things that they will use, and they're still actually falling into the old habit of trying to breathe away the nervous energy or the thoughts, okay? So it's really important that mindfulness is just bringing yourself into the present. That's all it is. Meditation is more around relaxation. Transcendental medica- meditation certainly is. So whatever you're doing or whatever you're getting your athletes to do, make sure it's mindfulness-based grounding work, not just Eastern meditative stuff because that generally is more about promoting seeking an alternate state. So I embrace that discomfort's here to, here to show up. It's the price of entry. It's actually a familiar friend. Okay, now let's just bring myself into the present. Might just be a breath, might be my feet on the ground, might be a sip of water. My racing car drivers just squirt the bottle in their helmet and just feel the water going down their back, uh, down their chest, into their, into their stomach as they're doing 300, 350 k's an hour down the back straight. It's, you can do it so rapidly, you know, so it's, it can be done really easily on a golf course with in between shots. And then the third step is do what matters. It's a bit of the Nike. But it's not just do it, it's do what matters. What matters? What shot would you play here on a Tuesday in the Pro-Am? Well, Jonah, you'd you'd carry the water because, you know, the risk-reward, it's fine, I can hit that shot, I do it every day. And and what's your brain telling you right now? Well, it's the final of the Masters and, uh, yeah, choice point. What do you want to do? What version of yourself do you want to be? Am I willing to walk in and hit the shot that matters, the right shot? Think about the ulterior. Only hit that shot when you're calm, confident, have unwavering self-belief, and you, you know, and your heart rate's in the right zone. You know, I always say my guys wouldn't even run on the footy field or wouldn't even go onto the Olympic track. Or, you know, it's being willing to feel the noise, to feel the discomfort, but go, I'm not going to compromise on the golf shot. And people ask me a lot about, you know, the good golfers I work with and how we reverse engineer that and what do you learn. And I'd probably say that, you know, that's one thing Cam does better than nearly any golfer I've worked with in, in, I've been on 16 years now of pro golf, is his uncompromising, I guess, buy into that that philosophy. And I, I, I remember this, I've been with him four years. I remember he'd, He'd only won, I'm terrible, I'm, I'm not a you know, golf tragic per se, so I have to remember this. Um, he'd won one of those tournaments that was like a pairing, I think, with Jonas or somebody. So he hadn't won much. He'd only really won, and he won in Australia a few times. And he was in a playoff, and he hit it in the water. And I was like, oh, that didn't quite go to plan. <laughs> Here I was thinking I've only been with him six months and whew, we're going to get a win really early on and it's all great. And yeah, no, he hit it in the water. Yeah, yeah, lost the playoff. And I remember sort of debriefing and, you know, let's, let's walk through that. What happened? He goes, yeah, yeah, well, I was just trying to take the same line as I took, you know, earlier on in the day and then what I'd been taking all weekend, which had been working because that's what got me into the playoff. And uh, yeah, let's put a bad swing on it. Um, yeah, you know, it's the right shot. So um, what do you want to do for dinner? Like... And in that moment, I knew he was 65 in the world and I knew we were going places because he was like, we'd done the work around committing to the right shot despite the context. So the expression I use is play the shot, not the context. Play the shot, not the context. Does the ball know it's a playoff? No. But you do. You're a human. You have a brain. You, have, you, know, you, have, you care. So don't try to be a robot. You know the context, but what 
what shot can you play in this context? And really, it's just about course management and reversing back with your caddy. And so when I look at, you know, warming up on the range and I see Cam versus other guys, you know, they're all good, right? They're all good. What separates good from great is generally the ability to play that shot, even if there's consequence. Oh, I can't believe he went lower tier on the 6th, 17th, whatever is it, at players when... Yeah, well, his coach and I were looking at each other when we knew exactly where it was going because that's the shot he plays every single day he plays that course. Yeah, but he could have lost the... Tw yep. Uh-huh. He was willing to lose the player's championship but not willing to compromise on how he dissects a golf course. It's too important to him to be the golfer he is and connect to his values and be the best version of himself and not the left option that's safe and club down and steer and do what most of us do when pressure shows up. That's what separates good from great. It's not actually swing mechanics per se in that environment. They're all got great swings. So three-step model, embrace whatever shows up. Learn to be really good at feeling crap. Then, once you've made room for that, bring yourself back into the here and now through multiple different techniques and then be very, very clear on what the committed behavior is. Now I want to introduce a bit of a psychological concept called experiential avoidance. Experiential avoidance. The best metaphor I can use is who here has been at a lovely cocktail party, probably hosted by the board here at this beautiful golf course, and there's some lovely canapes and, and hors d'oeuvres going around, and you've got some spinach in your teeth. And say I'm at that party, and then Jamie, because I know him and we work with a, a, you know, an athlete together, walks up and says, Jonah, you've got some spinach in your teeth. And I say, oh, thanks, Jamie. Appreciate you telling me. And then I think, hang on a second. I've chatted to a few people in the last 20 minutes. But being the cheeky psychologist, I go back to those people and I say, excuse me, um, did I have spinach in my teeth when we chatted? And you sort of get all awkward and, oh, well, yeah. And I say, why didn't you just say something? What's the most common reason, they say? I didn't want to make you feel awkward. I didn't really know you. I thought you'd figure it out. I don't know. I, I was going to, and then I went to, but then I thought, oh. And I say, you liar. <laughs> what? I'm not a liar. I say, you lying. You didn't want to feel bad. Just as you went to say something, you get that little rise of anxiety and you went, oh, he'll figure it out. Oh. That there is experiential avoidance. We do it every day in our life. We don't performance manage a staff member who's doing something not that well because we don't want them to think we're a bad boss. We don't tell our partner what we really think about their cooking. I don't know. We, we avoid stuff all the time. Sometimes that's smart, right? But like we avoid things all the time when tough emotion shows up. Humans see a snake, our brain has evolved to go snake, feel some anxiety, walk away, anxiety goes down, we go, oh, that feels better. That's the reinforcement. So we are avoidant animals. So what does experiential avoidance look like on the golf course? Your job as coaches is to intimately know what the experiential patterns are in your golfers in tournament play. Why? They don't need to go and do another range session on their sh wedge game. If their wedge game is great on a, on, a, on a Monday, what happens on a Sunday? Oh, yeah, Jonah, they decel. What happens with off the tee? Oh, they, they steer if they're in a good position. Or, you know, I'm not a golf coach, so forgive my language. But, like, oh, they, 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 they always leave, you know, their speed goes out the window. We'll do some putting stuff in a bit. They, oh, they, oh, they always leave their putt short. Even though I tell them, I tell them all the time, you know, never up, never in. Yeah. I think every golfer knows that. But why don't they? Or it could be really overt, right? Oh, why'd you take why'd you take three iron when it was three wood all day long? Yeah? So experiential avoidance. You're the experts in golf and you know your clients better than anybody. You gotta actually look at what they're showing you they can do out here and what changes in tournament golf. What happens when the snakes, the metaphorical snakes, show up? What are they doing to make themselves feel safer on the golf course that actually leads to long-term underperformance? 
at the very pointy end of some of the pros that we work with, it's tiny, right? But that's the difference between 65 in the world and, and second in the world. You know, it's just putting speed in maybe in one case. Or it could just be, yeah, something, something to do with their mechanics. You, you know, it's granular at the very pointy end, but with the developmental athlete, you'll see huge avoidance, right? Um, oh, I don't want to play this golf course because I didn't play well there last time. Oh, wow. Okay. How's that growing the capacity? How's that building our strength to sit and, you know, but avoid, avoid, avoid. So you've got to get after avoidance really, really aggressively. Um, mindful of time as well, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep going. Uh, do, do, do. So our job ultimately is to foster automaticity. I think we'd all agree. Develop motor patterns that are really automatic, flow. So I want to sort of shift gears now and talk a little bit about pre-shot routines and you know what we do on the on the range and the good stuff we can do, but then also the transferability of that into into tournament play. Before I do, let's just take a step back into skill development and transfer. The one thing that I see done poorly in all sport around the world is the understanding of embedding or transfer. And golf's pretty good at being guilty to that, in that I can sort of see a lesson and I see, you know, a, ba a bucket of balls being hit. And generally, you know, the, the client can generally improve in that moment, yeah, throughout that, that lesson. Great, I'm hitting it so well. I go, that didn't show me anything. It takes a minimum of six hours, minimum of six hours for any skill to go from frontal, prefrontal into parietal and even down into more deeper structures. Minimum of six hours. So all you're doing there is just, it's just cramming, right? It's just, you know, it's just short-term memory. There's no learning, there's no transfer. So you can only really evaluate learning of what you're teaching your athletes at least six hours later minimum. But think about what happens when you have an athlete just before a tournament, they show up, they see you on the, let's call it the Monday or the Tuesday or anything, even the morning of the tournament, and you do some work on the range, and they're, and they're dialed in, they're in the pocket, they're just flying out, they're feeling great, you're feeling great, and then they go out there and they suck. And you think, oh, what's going on? You've set up what's called a violation of expectation. So another bit of a Dr. Phil concept here. I'm now hitting it really well, so my expectation is I'm good. But the skill actually hasn't been embedded. It's just a short-term little stimulus. I then go out, you know, the next day. It hasn't been consolidated and embedded. I then don't play as well as I was hitting it on the range. Not only am I not playing as well, what's happening intrinsically in my brain? I'm now sort of panicking. Or I've got, you know, something going on where it's like, why can't I do this? It's all that self-deprecation and it's frustration and we've all got clients who are quick to anger. It normally comes up with, you know, expressions of anger. They feel lost. They're disconnected from owning their swing. And then they want another lesson and more coat and you're in this in this cycle. So the easiest change is do some work on whatever skill you're developing. And please then evaluate it in a, in a realistic environment the next day and give them a reality check. You're not that good, champ. Sorry. Wake up. You're going to miss some fairways. And that's okay. We can still play some good golf. But the, the, the 15 to 20 balls that you hit perfectly yesterday isn't what's going to show up tomorrow if we actually haven't done that work long term. You're doing them a favor. Oh, but Jonah, I could be rattling their confidence. You're getting them in contact with their competence and then work around it, play to it, versus thinking they're, you know, amazing, then violating their standard, then getting really angry, and then losing the plot and then shooting a score that's well above their normal because they got so caught up in their own self-critical critical, uh, criticism. Does that, can people relate to that? So you've got to be really careful. I, I know it's a bit patronising, but you can actually do harm doing a really nice range session and not actually then evaluating the transfer of that skill the night before a tournament. Um, 
You got your clubs? You want to hit some balls? No? Why not? You're there? You got some place? Would you expound on Cameron Smith, nervous at the Open Championship, um, and all that meant? And more about tools that you had given him beforehand so he can own it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So that, that, that model is effectively everything I've done with Cam. We, we worked heavily on his ability at being okay, it's that can go down, guys. I, I won't use it. So, um, did a lot of work on his ability at being uncomfortable. So Cam is like all of our elite athletes: obsessional, perfectionistic, quick to anger, hates him. You know, hates being anything but you know, perfect at what he does. He's you know, he's normal. So um, when I first started working with him, yep. He, he would derail a little bit with either getting caught up in his anxiety and trying to get rid of his nerves or, you know, quick to anger and get too self-critical and therefore lose his focus. So we did a lot of work around that. Um, and then techniques to be you know, in the present and, and that committed stuff I've already addressed. So let, let's fast forward four years and we get, get to, the, to the open. Um, day three, for those who watched, he obviously putts didn't drop. And you can probably guess the emotional state he was in. You know, he wasn't happy. He was annoyed. He was agitated. He's human. He cares. So he came off the off the 18th and I met him there and he was pretty, you know, just annoyed, right? He put in such a good round on day one and two and he was in a, in a good place and then for nothing to drop. And I thought, oh, this will go one of two ways. We'll see. And he eyeballed me and Grant, his coach, and said, you two, let's go. Putting green. I was like, good, let's solve this problem. And we went and we did 30 minutes on the green. It was 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night over there. And, you know, it was just a thing with tempo. It was just one little thing. But amazing, right? He's for such a good putter. Um, not, not, not even five footers were going in on the practice screen. He just couldn't sink a putt. It was just bizarre. And, like, his coach and I looked at each other. This is, yeah, this is weird. Like, it doesn't normally break down like that. And he's sort of looking a bit incredulously. And I sort of just stopped and said, let's just work on one thing at a time. One thing at a time. If it's path, just fix up your path first. If it's tempo, let's just connect to tempo. If it's speed, let's just work around with speed. Then we'll put that all together and then, then let's start looking at whether the ball goes in. He was too, all golfers do this, right? They'd boom. Uh, they're instantly tracking the outcome of the putt, whether it's going in the hole. Instead of warming up path, warming up the rhythm, warming up speed. And just not caring about the outcome of the actual putts going in. You're warming up individual elements. And then let's put it all together and see what happens. So we just went back and did some sequencing around that. Uh, and then I did some stuff around embracing what is going to show up the next day. Final day. Fair bit behind. You can probably want to turn into Superman. Try to really start super aggressive lines. Chasing. And he's, you know, we, so we had that conversation over breakfast. What's the, what's the plan? He's like, same golf. I was playing good golf yesterday. The putts just weren't dropping. We fixed that issue. Back to our usual. I said, right. And then, like I said, as we moved through the day, as the emotions got more and more on the crowd, the scoreboard was there, that the occasion was getting pretty, pretty significant. Just the usual things around learning how to make room for it. A little sip of water. It's okay. Just, you know, it's normal. It's a price of entry. But the one thing you saw probably from watching that is him and his co uh, caddy Pinner was just absolute clarity on club selection and course management. And that's when I knew we were okay because there was not a single deviation from the way he was dissecting that golf course. And in terms of his connection to speed, which I was going to do some putting stuff, but we can just talk about it here because of time, is that the biggest thing we do with there is the ability to work backwards. Read a putt pick something or, you know, intermediate, if that's what you and your guys, you know, girls or guys do, and then your last connection is just speed. Where golfers get wrong is we're so caught up in our attachment to where the putt's going or we're still in between a read or we're still trying to do read and speed and line and at the same time that we have that cognitive dissonance. So it's like being a sniper 
you assess the wind, you assess the altitude, you assess the factors, then all you need is think about pulling the trigger at the right time. Well, for him, we work on you know, doing all that and working back, and then it's just dialing into speed like your life depends on it, just connecting to that because everything else is set up. Whereas you know, being in between means the quality of your speed is just not there, and that's why you leave putts short or what have you because you're not just connecting to that. So we do a huge amount of single tasking, even when your brain wants to do more. Yeah. From back to front. Thank you. Chasing me down. Hey, Mike. Um, that was pretty good, huh? You guys are. I had a lot of fun with you guys today. Yeah. Um, anyways, the dr the driving range when we first came here, this was basically like a. A junkyard, literally. We found an old Buick out there that was buried out there. And it was a shed range, so we would hit him out there. So originally, um, when I practice, you know, once a month or once every two months, I would kind of hit him across the range this way into the wind like that. And then we started using this area. And then Patrick and I, about uh, 10 years ago, we came up with Cantlay Alley. I don't know, this place used to have a lot of trees and then uh, all the trees left, but we still got some stumps. I'm not sure what happened to the trees, but I know our director of agronomy is smiling about that. If you're a tree lover, sorry. Uh, by the way, before he cuts them down, he puts a, a face, a sad face on them. Having a good time with you guys. So anyways, uh, can't, can't lay alley over there is like 200 and... 30 yards bred all the way down, and the stumps are 20 yards apart, and the greens uh, 10 yards apart, which is like normally the width of a green. So he'd start out hitting balls in that direction into the perfect wind, and then the ball would go in the middle of that, and then we'd work the right stump and the left stump with the idea that we never went outside the stumps. So for a guy that's a... Uh, uh, in the top 20 and 50 statistical categories, he's been training like that to do that for a long, long time as far as that goes. And then it's funny, when you go to driving ranges, like it all seems like the driving range isn't level and you're hitting into a wind that doesn't seem to make sense. So the beauty of this wind is like if you just point it in the wind direction that blows in perpetuity almost every day, it kind of comes right into your face like this if you're a right-handed player. So this has been a, a good spot. And then... Uh, 400 yards across, and the tee is like uh, 75 to 80 yards just from the front to the back of the tee like that, and the turf is lovely. And then what you're going to see tomorrow, the six-hole golf course that we made, and that area over there, and this driving range, we basically did those for about a million four totally, but when we bid it out with uh, somebody, it was like between 8 and $11 million dollars. So we basically did it with the shaper um, and drew things up kind of on our, on our hand. And this was an idea that we all had in our hand. So when you think about it, we really did it for dimes on the dollar. So it's turned out to be pretty cool. This is where the members hit balls, and it feels like their spot. And I also like the idea that it kind of takes a little while to get down there. Everybody, you know, a couple members like, oh, the other range, we could just go over there in 45 seconds. It's two and a half minutes in a golf cart to get down here. So if you don't have that extra minute and a half, I don't know what to tell you about the game. It's a good time to just chill and go down and come back. So that's that. Okay. Hey, man. Um, we're going to paint a hole. This would be a typical thing that we would do, okay? Uh, v, let's play the uh, 18th hole at uh, Ponte Vedra, which we forgot to mention that um, Cam won the Players' Championship. How about a hand for that? Players' Championship and the Open Championship, two of the biggest golf tournaments played in one year. Fantastic job, Coach. Nice work. So this is the 18th hole in V. Everything with the white 1909 is left, and that would be a spot where we wouldn't want the ball to go to. And the spot that we want the ball to go to, you see the smallest telephone pole down there, uh, which is about uh, right over the black checkered flag? The black checkered flag. Okay, that's our target, all right? And the wind's blowing. The, not a girl. Hear that? Specific target. Um, the pole to the right of that. And the wind's blowing from the right here as well, too. So this is your shot. So picture the shot you want to hit, and then we'll go from there, and you guys can do your stuff.
No hand? I mean, come on. If, you're, don't, if you can't laugh, you can at least clap. There we go. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Good answer. Yeah. So, uh, observations. <clears throat> As, again, like the previous presentation, a lot to like. All right. First thing that stood out to me was the difference between looking and focusing. The number one thing I look for for pre-shot routine is looking versus focusing. Focusing is when my mind and my eyes are aligned, so what I'm looking at is what I'm thinking about. Whereas I see a lot of this on the on, on, literally with some very good pros on the world tour. That is junk. You are doing nothing with your eyes. All you're doing is moving your vestibular system and probably, you know, messing up your balance. Like, it's not serving a purpose. If you're going to move your eyes anywhere during a pre-shot routine, it must be for a reason. Do something with it. It doesn't mean you have to be long. You don't have to go... Aah. It's just when you do move your eyes, connect and focus. I loved how you were focusing on your target. Quick question about swing thoughts. Do you... Do you have a, yeah, do you, what, what swing thoughts do you have? Do you have any? Do you not? Do you think of eating an apple? What, what does your mind do? Um, usually I have too many, so I'm trying to get rid of them. And um, I find that the easiest way for me is not to have a lot of in mind, but the target and just focus on good tempo. Love that. And what gets in the way? When doesn't it sh when when do you get to swing thought? You know when does it get noisy? You know when a shot is uncomfortable to me or it doesn't fit my eye. That's where I like to go to. I like to go to my technique because that's what I feel comfortable with, and I feel like well, if I make sure that I swing pretty and nice and well, then the shot is gonna go where I want to, even though the shot doesn't fit good in my eye. But I have done that for too long and it's not working. Awesome. I think everybody here can relate. You've probably got multiple clients who are all the same. I certainly do. Um, so let's this, is a can this is a candid one. Will be really helpful, and we'll be with her, and this is for your benefit, and we've been through this a bunch of time. One of the things that's really cool about him, and we, we share a client, so it's fun to listen to him, is I also feel a lot, and I know some of you have some your psychologist stuff, but I also feel a lot with a psychologist as they're trying to make somebody feel good for playing bad about themselves. Oh, it doesn't matter. Your wife still loves you. Your kids still love you. Yeah. You shot 74, you know. It's not going to work. You're going to be broke pretty soon. So um, he's straight up, like, just this is the way it is, and this is what you do. And then um, to my favorite over there, like, as I said, we've been doing this for 18 years together. And when anybody says, like, oh, who's the best person that you coach? You know, Luke List got a beautiful swing, or, you know, Nellie Corder got a beautiful swing. Like, uh, I'll show everybody V swing, and they're like, "Who's who's this girl?" You know, and at one time, I would say it's probably a decade ago. I finally like just sat down on the ground like this and said, "Tell me um, what you're thinking before you hit it." And I was sitting down there for 30 minutes. <laughs> no kidding. So, and she went through the, everything. You know, the Varden grip. Um, the posture, the move away, the whole nine yards, you know. And then I'm like, well, just hit this one without thinking about any of that. I videoed them both, you know. So then, uh, and I didn't tell her which one was first. And I go, well, which one was best? And she goes, I like the second one a little better. And I said, why? And she goes, I don't know. It just looks a little bit better. Well, the second one didn't have any of the thoughts about that. So the point of the story is, like, even if you have an amazing client that they can swing beautiful and they look great when they can play she holds the course record here she's won six professional tournaments she's a lovely player there's still a little bit in her mind like i need to do more and i need to do more technical wise as opposed to which pole should i hit it there and hit it at yeah it's great insight and i loved your answer loved hearing that that insight too from you jamie um two two things come to mind firstly let's talk about analogies you want to teach a six-year-old how to hit a top spin forehand in tennis you say kiss your bicep take the racket and just kiss your bicep all of a sudden racket head angle rotation coming through whatever whatever and you'll get six-year-olds hitting perfect top spin forehands just by telling them to kiss their bicep right our brains are analogy we love analogy we learn through metaphor or pronate your brachioradialis right you know Pretend you're squatting with a beach ball between your legs. Oh, perfect golf setup. Our brain loves metaphor and analogy. Then we get really good and skilled, and we get really technical with all of our 3D modeling. 
But the best thing you can do with a highly skilled athlete is actually go back to analogy. I've got Olympic discus throwers. Discus throw is a bit like golf. It's a very technical thing. You've got to be right in that circle. And it's rub the cigarette butt out with your front foot. That's the cue in the Olympic final and the world's watching. Instead of thinking about 105 degrees of angular acceleration to make sure I launch it at the 42 degree 0.5. No, no. Just rub the cigarette butt out. Yeah? So think a bit about being courageous. You're not being a casual coach by being brave enough to use playful metaphor and analogy. The other thing that comes to mind is we will always have thoughts of some degree. So some golfers try to have no thoughts over the ball. If you try to have no thought, it'll work on the driving range. It won't work in tournament golf. When pressure shows up, we become anchored to threats. Yeah? We walk through the woods at, in the daytime. G'day, how are ya? We walk through the woods at nighttime. What was that noise? What was that noise? We're much more orientated to any noise that could be a threat. What threats do golfers possess? The obvious ones, wind, this hole's not set up how I like, how I played last tee shot, you know, those common ones. But the most common are swing thoughts, right? How I'm feeling, what's going on. So all of a sudden, a useful input that coach and athlete develop out here is now a threat and therefore a distraction in tournament golf. So I'm really big on all my pro golfers learning to have swing thoughts that they connect to that are much more extrinsic, analogous, you know, very simple, you know, and like stuff you probably do with 12 and 13 year olds, but it actually then works for the highly skilled athlete again when pressure's around. So, you know, firstly, every what's the likelihood when you go to a golf course, it's got some holes that set up how you don't like, you're going to have thoughts, I don't like this hole. What's the likelihood? Oh, 100%. 100%. Correct answer. So why don't we prepare for that? As opposed to hoping those thoughts don't show up, as opposed to going, I hope I don't feel uncomfortable on this, versus going, oh, this is the uncomfortable hole. Yeah, okay, brain, what do you got for me? Get on the front foot. Expect it. Oh, the old crossover. Ah, <laughs> yeah, about time it showed up. We're on the 12th. Be playful. Be light. See it with normality. And then come back to a swing thought that is less about heaps of technical stuff about what you're doing here and in here and just something far more either out here intermediate target sometimes just get the ball over that dot there or something that is much more playful that you and your coach have worked on that gets you into those swing patterns surfing yeah yeah she's a uh she runs on this beach uh where i surf and um uh, everybody that always paddles out on the water and go, hey, who's the hot chick up there doing the boxing thing or running down the beach? You know, I'm like, I don't know, I've never seen her before. Um, you're you're growing on me. Um, any, anyways, uh, you know, she's like, what do you think when you're surfing? I'm, I don't know. I just see a wave and paddle, stand up and try to ride it. One little tiny piece of technique. So I think one thing's a knot. Um, she was winning a tournament that I was caddying for her by like eight shots on a hard golf course on a really windy spot. We were playing with Yelini, no? Is that how you say her name? Yeah, Le, Le, you know, YN. So we were playing with her and um, like we got to the 10th hole and it felt different. Felt like, you know, and when we sat on the 11th tee, it was like, hey, we're just we got eight holes left, and we're just going to play targets and win, and that's all we're going to do. And there's not a chance that you lose this tournament. And her face switched around like, okay, now she's just going to do what you said. She's just going to focus on that spot. So the interesting thing, well, what we get to do for a living, and sometimes it goes great like that. You know, sometimes you say that and they don't do it, but I've seen her where she can chew on it and do it in that situation uh, all the time. So now the idea is, can we do it more often? Uh, v, let's burn and draw uh, that spins around the red flag, the red shed flag, checkered flag there, and it looks like our eighth hole if you were playing it from the back tee on the left there. So she's going to hit a hard draw, Jono, which would be a typical of the shot that you hit on the 10th hole at Augusta. Gotcha. <clears throat> she clicked out. Say that again. What were you thinking about when you clicked out? Okay. Just give the hole again. Just set it up. Yeah. Thanks for coming to our therapy session, everybody. <laughs> Finally, V, 4 o'clock, we got him to laugh, okay? But 
your mind. There's this great Lauren Hill thing. I went to see her in concert, and she was all by herself. And um, she was all by herself. And, and she came out, and she was wearing this white, white like, Fila suit. She looked really cool. It was just a candle, just her and her guitar. And she's kind of warming up, and it's perfectly silent with her guitar. And then she says, um, could everybody please be quiet? And it was just silent in there, and everybody was like kind of looking like that, and nobody said anything. She goes, oh, no, no, you guys are fine. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the voices in my head. So like that, that, that's kind of, that would be a typical thing. Yeah. Very smart, yep. very athletic, think about a lot, doesn't need to think about much. Let's burn and draw right around that red flag, okay? Like those are perfect, right, Jonah? Yeah. I mean, just yeah. perfect, perfect, perfect shot. So, let's talk about two things. I love when you said that you, when you're playing well on a whole, you feel comfortable. You generally connect to something like just your your tempo, like your stock. I'm assuming it's like an 85 percent. Is it for you, or 90, or what? Like what's your stock standard T? Is it 85, 90 percent max? Oh, yeah. 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 Like 85. Okay. So that, that that's a great thing to connect to. Um, I think a lot of people would probably coach that. Um, similarly, it's like, it's like connecting to speed with your putt as your last sort of anchor. Really good. Let's talk about two things, though. Trust. Out here on the driving range or the putting green, you are training trust. You are training your relationship to your ability to either trust the speed on the green Trust, you know, what you're putting into that wedge shot. Trust, you know, the volume that you're bringing to that, that driver. And you get really good at trusting that relationship. You then take that into a pressure situation and inhibition kicks in. Inhibition. If there's a snake on the ground, what happens? If I said, you've got to catch it, we get tentative. We inhibit. We get cautious, we slow down. That's what brains do. That's why you warm up with the right putting speed and you're warming up beautifully and then you go on to the whatever hole where you've got to make that up and down or you're on the cut line or at the 18th at, at the open and all of a sudden, you tr yeah, it is, there it is, that feels right, I trust that and then you hit it and you're like, why am I seven feet short? That's a horrible distance, oh my God, it's that spicy seven footer I've now got to make. Because our brain inhibits with pressure. So this is going to sound really bizarre. For you that uses, say, your, your, you know, your, you know, your, your swing, your tempo as your anchor, when you're in a really pressured environment, I don't want you to trust what your brain's telling you. I reckon your brain will make you steer. I reckon your brain would make you leave putt short. Even though you've done all the good work, all the good training, all the good swing mechanics, all the 3D modeling, all the warm-up was great, then pressure shows up and all of a sudden you're like, why did I get a bit steery? Why did I desell that little, that little chip? Why did I leave that putt short? So how do I help Cam and others putt well when they're really, really nervous? Add 2%. Not 10%, just 2% psychologically add 2% more than you want to do. If it feels wrong, then it's right. It should be this on the green. And there's my... Oh, no, that feels like I'm going to go you know, a bit too far past the hole. Yep, good. That's probably about right. Because it hasn't been going for the last 16 holes. Uh, short, 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 short. So you're still trusting yourself? The data is telling you your brain is lying to you. So walk in... Find that trusty feeling of the weight of that part or the speed of that drive and add 2%. And then your coach will be watching it. Your 3D mechanics will be watching it. And they'll be like, yeah, Joe, that's just a normal swing. And she'll be going, whoo, that had a little bit more spice on it than I wanted to give it. But it brings out the automaticity. So that's a little trick that I've sort of 
played around with in golf where I see this classic inhibition of why do I decel, why do I steer, why do I leave things short because the human brain will want to inhibit. So instead of getting technical on those holes that don't quite set up right, I'd imagine what's actually happening is you're getting a little bit tentative with your swing patterns. And so let's stay with the same cueing, but add just 2% more. So instead of 85, make it 87. And if it feels just that little bit uncomfortable, that's your feedback that it's the right amount. Yeah. What sometimes goes wrong is you go, yeah, yeah, got to add 2%. Ah, oh, that's it. That feels good. No, no, no. <laughs> You're still back in your comfort zone and you're going to leave it, you know, leave the putt short. Cool. We're going to get two more golf shots. Yeah. Uh, let's come back here. Let's uh, imagine that you're on a tweener five par that you can reach in two and there's nothing in front of you. So we're going to hit it, that club off the ground. And uh, she does this really nicely. And uh, this is more athletic and trusting it. And if this isn't flushed, it doesn't matter because you're probably going to lay it up from there anyways. Okay. So really, really comfortable, dead straight, last person on the left down there. Okay, want to talk about it? Want to talk about that one? No okay. No, it's just that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, one driver off the tee. She's going to, um, the US Open is at Pebble Beach this year for uh, a California player that lives in California, that's like, you know, yeah. that's if you were surfing, you'd be at Bell's Beach, right? Gotcha. So um, uh, she's got a one-shot lead going into Sunday, and you get to say one thing to her before that uh, based on just what you know of her so far. What you got? Don't change. Great players are defined by how much they don't change as the context changes. I love that. So it's about how do I sit, hit the same shots? How do I course manage the same? How do I maintain the same swing mechanics? How do I, you know, whatever that is, don't change. Your emotions will change. The context changes. Your self-criticism will change. Your nervous energy will change. Your hopes, dreams and desires will change. Your, all that will change. Don't change what you do with the ball. It doesn't know what's going on. So it's the ability not to change what you bring whilst I always say... Play robotically whilst being intimately human. If you were a robot that, you know, we've seen some of those on the internet with machines hitting, the, you know, it, it's almost how much can I just be really, really consistent behaviorally whilst allowing me to be completely human, which means varied and nuanced and scared and excited and hopeful and doubtful. That's what the human brain is. Whereas we try to do the opposite. We try to control our brain and in doing so, fail and then lose our focus. So be scared, be nervous, be excited, but don't change what you do with the ball. That'd be my advice. Yeah. My opinion on that one, you don't change like that too. I, it reminds me of Christmas tree. So uh, we're going to hit one more for you and go, come on back here. Okay. So I caddy for her at uh, Columbia on the Edgewater uh, and she needed to like, I think she needed to make the cut in order to keep her tour card. And um, the, hole that we're playing Columbia in the Edgewater it's got a bunch of Christmas trees up there you know so this was back when the caddy could stand behind the player now they can't do that so she warms up perfectly and we walk to the first team we're going to set up and I'm standing behind her and I go oh Christmas tree oh Christmas tree na 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 and everybody here in her group started laughing and then That was E minor, by the way. Beautiful. Nice. Lovely. How about it for Miss Veronica Fellaber? Char's going to, uh, yeah, we'll but, let you go and then. I want one final sentence. And it's something I saw recently and I loved it. How can we survive in the jungle if we're raised in the zoo?
How can you survive in the jungle if you're raised in a zoo? When I, I've just come back from Saudi Arabia where they're hitting up desert. Then I'm going down to the PGA in South Carolina next week. And the ball isn't in the fairway very often. It's in weird spots. It's in places you don't like. It's a jungle out there. There's competitors. Everyone's cutthroat. These beautiful facilities you got here, I love it. Just make sure it's not a zoo. Fat, lazy animals who don't really need to go hunting for their food. That isn't what the PGA, LPGA is. Make sure the training environments you create are more like the jungle for the reality of the real world of pro golf. Thanks for your time. Uh, how far is that flight? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. How far is your flight? Or flight? What? Yeah, that you come in here. Uh, I'm trying to think. I left... Like last week? Yeah, I left. It was 20, <laughs> 22 hours of Saudi Arabia, and then I just came back, and it was another 16 or 17 or something. So, oh my. so how about that, <laughs> folks? Thank you so very much, Jonah. It's a treat to have you here. Jamie, your singing's not getting any better. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Mr. Randy Chang is going to guide us through uh, some presentations with Tech Time. We're going to do it right out here, and then in a little bit, we'll head back up to the clubhouse.